Hello everyone and welcome to Mr. Salcedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over the very last chapter that we're going to be covering in our AP Chemistry series. This is from Zumdahl, the 7th edition, but just like in the previous video. Um, the 7th edition, this is chapter 17, <laughs> but in all future editions it's chapter 18. So I kind of used the 9th edition as my basis for this, so you'll see 18 repeatedly. Um, there is a table that we're going to be using. Uh, I put both the table from the 7th edition and the 8th edition onwards. So let's talk about balancing oxidation reduction equations. So it says review of terms. Um, the terms for electrochemistry, right? And so that's what this entire unit is about. Um, and electrochemistry is the study of the interchange of chemical and electrical energy. Uh, a lot of the terms get confusing, and we're going to try to use them as, let's say, um, we're going to try to use the words as uh, clearly as possible when I'm trying to explain these things, but it's possible that I end up making a verbal error because oxidation and reduction, man, I'm telling you, this is the one bit of chemistry that has so much vocabulary, it gets a little difficult. Um, and you can start to mix up certain terms. So let's talk about redox first, right? So redox is reduction oxidation, right? So that's what the red part of this stands for and the ox part of this stands for. And it involves a transfer of electrons from the reducing agent to the oxidizing agent. Now, what is oxidation? Oxidation is a loss of electrons. And the way that um, my teacher, even back when I was in high school and also my professors in college, um, they used oil to remember oxidation is losing. So again, oil stands for oxidation is losing. And what are we losing? We're losing electrons. For reduction, it's gaining electrons. And a lot of times people get that confused because it says reduce. So you'd think that means to lower something. Um, but in reality, um, reduction stands for a gaining of electrons. So reduction is gaining oxidation is losing. Now, if you're wondering why it's called reduction, it's called reduction because of oxygen. Um, and generally speaking, things that are getting reduced lose oxygen. And generally speaking, things that are being oxidized gain oxygen. So it's not like they were purposefully trying to confuse you. It's just that we're looking at this from the perspective of electrons, which when these things were probably named, they didn't even know what an electron was. So what is a reducing agent then? So a reducing agent is an electron donor. And so the way that I remember that is rad, reducing agent donor. And then oxidizing agents, there really aren't, I couldn't really think of a good one for this, but oxidizing agents are electron acceptors. And so it's just, oh, uh, again, I couldn't think of anything good. So half reactions. Now, generally speaking, because redox reactions have an oxidation component and a reduction component, you can split the reaction into half reactions, where one half is showing the oxidation, the other half is showing the reduction. And so a good example of that would be something like this, right? So this looks pretty intense and pretty crazy looking. We have a permanganate ion, we have some iron two, we have some manganese two, and we have some iron three ions. We also have some protons here, so it's an acidic solution, and then we have some water on the opposite side. So I could, though, split that into two halves. So this half of the reaction in red here is showing the reduction part of this reaction, and the oxidation part is in blue here. It is this part. You're probably thinking, how am I supposed to know how to split this into two halves like that? Well, thankfully, uh, there is a method that we're going to use in order to do it, and you wouldn't be asked to just do that by looking directly at an equation like this. Um, there's a simpler way uh, than just kind of staring at an equation and figuring it out. So here is the method that we're going to learn to do this. It's called the half reaction method, and notice that this is happening in acidic solution. So there is a second way of doing this when it's in a basic solution, um, but they're basically, for lack of a better word, the same exact thing. It's just in one, we're using, you know, protons, H plus, in order to balance something. And then ironically, even in basic solution, we use H plus, and then we neutralize it with hydroxide in order to make neutral water molecules. So it kind of is the same thing no matter what. So here are our steps. 
write the oxidation and reduction half reactions. And it's not going to be something crazy like you saw in the previous slide. It's really just going to have two things in it. Now, for each half reaction, what you want to do is balance all of the elements except for hydrogen and oxygen first. Then balance the oxygens using water and balance the remaining hydrogens using H+. And then at the very end, you balance the charge using the electrons. Once you've done that, if you have an equal number of electrons on the left side of your equation and on the right side of your half reaction equations, um, then you are basically done. You can add them together. But if necessary, you might have to multiply one or both by an integer in order to make sure the number of electrons transferred is the same. So in other words, if you are losing two electrons in your oxidation part, you are gaining three electrons in your reduction part, that's not going to equal anything because <laughs> you have two electrons on one and three electrons on the other side. So you would have to multiply them both by a number in order to get them to equal the smallest common number that we can think of between three and two, which would be six, right? So you'd have to multiply the one with the two electrons by three in order to make that six electrons, and you'd have to do the exact same thing for the opposite, okay? Now, you add them together and cancel identical species, and you check to make sure that everything is balanced and you're done. So here is a chart of what you do. So separate half reactions, balance, we balance, we equalize, we equalize, we cancel, and then we check. And that's basically it. All right, here is a good example, right? So we have a dichromate ion, we have a sulfite ion, we have a chromium-3 ion, and then we have a sulfate ion. How can we balance this equation? Remember, first thing we want to do is separate it into two half reactions. How do we do that? Well, this dichromate is turning into this chromium-3 ion. This sulfite is turning into sulfate. So that's all you do. You literally write one like that, and then we say, hey, wait a second. I have two chromium on this side. I only had one chromium on this side. And remember, the first thing we try to balance are just anything but hydrogens and oxygens. So I'd have to put a two in front of this in order to have that balance. Next, I have my second half reaction, sulfite, sulfate. Perfect. Notice that the sulfur, there's only one on this side. There's only one sulfur on this side. I don't even have to put a number in front of it. But that's step one, okay? And again, first step, balance everything except for the hydrogens and the oxygens. Now we can balance the oxygen atoms. So take a look, right? I have seven oxygens on this side. I have no oxygens on that side. That means I need seven water molecules on this side in order to have seven oxygens and then seven oxygens. All right, what about on this side? I have three oxygens, I have four. So I have to add a water molecule to this side in order to balance it out. All right, next, we want to balance our hydrogen atoms. So remember this reaction is occurring in acidic solution. And so because it's happening in acidic solution, um, I'm using H plus in order to balance this out. But like I said, even in basic solution, we technically use hydrogen ions. So we use H plus to balance it. It's just you then neutralize it with hydroxide in order to basically correct, you know, your, your assumption that we're in acidic solution. So let's count. I have seven times two. I have 14 hydrogens on this side. I have no hydrogens on this side. So I have to add 14 H pluses to that side. All right, next, I have two hydrogens on this side. I have no hydrogens on that side. So I add two H pluses on that side. All right. Now I have to balance the charge. Okay, so now I want to count. I have 14 positives. I have a 2 minus. That means that I have a plus 12 overall on this side. On this side, I have 3 times 2, so that's 6 plus, And that's basically it, because these are not charged, so plus 6. I need these to be the same number. So now I balance the charge using electrons. So I'm going to add 6 electrons to this side. So now I have a plus 6 and a plus 6, if that makes sense, right? This entire side has now a plus 6 charge. That entire side has a plus 6 charge. All right, let's do the same thing here. What's my charge on this side? Well, those are neutral. I have a minus two. Okay. What about on this side? I have a minus two and a plus two, so I have zero. I need them to be the same number. Minus two, so I'm going to add two electrons to this side, and now I have balanced my charge. Okay, now assuming that we followed our directions, 
I have six electrons on the left here. I have two electrons on the right here. Those are not the same number. That means I would need to take this entire bottom one that's in red and multiply everything by three. And I mean everything, the water, the sulfite, the sulfate, the hydrogen ions, and the electrons. Multiply everything by three in order to get them to cancel. Now, before I do that, I do want to now say, hey, I can kind of figure this out. Uh, what is my oxidation? Which one of these is oxidation and which one of these is reduction? Okay, so remember, oil rig, oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. Which one of these is losing and which one of these is gaining? All right, purple is gaining electrons. That means it is being reduced. Red is losing electrons. That means it's being oxidized. Now, remember what I said, <laughs> even though we're looking at electrons, right? Because it's reduction and oxidation. Notice that this goes from having seven oxygens to having no oxygens. That's where the term reduction comes from. Notice this has three oxygens and now it has four. That's where the term oxidation actually comes from. All right, so what's our reducing agent and what's our oxidizing agent? Well, um, this is our oxidizing agent because it is accepting electrons. And this is going to be our reducing agent because it is losing electrons. Okay, now make the number of electrons transferred the same. So like I just said, I have to multiply everything by three here. And when I do that, this is what I get. Okay, now we can start canceling things. So the first thing you should notice is that the number of electrons cancel. If you did everything correctly up to this point, you basically should end up with your electrons canceling. If you got to this point and your electrons don't cancel, you made a mistake. What else can I start to cancel? I have three water molecules on this side. I have seven molecules on this side. So I can really get rid of these three and subtract three water molecules from this side. What about this? I have 14 H's here. I have six here, so I can get rid of this and I can subtract six from this side. And so by doing that, this is my final balanced equation. Notice I subtracted six from this to get eight. Notice that again, I subtracted three from here to get four. And that's my final balanced equation. All right, what about basic solutions? So you do the exact same thing, like literally. And then when you finally get to the part <laughs> where we are now trying our best, right, to eliminate hydrogens and oxygens and stuff, right? So you get all the way to like, I guess technically it's still only step two. But before you start, you know, adding your electrons to balance charge, what you want to do is you want to add as many OHs as it takes in order to remove any hydrogens from your half reactions. Why? It's under basic solution, so that means that you can't have those hydrogen ions floating around. So by neutralizing them with OHs, OH minuses, right, hydroxides, you now are making water molecules. And yes, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So if you add, you know, three hydroxides to the left side in order to make water molecules, that means you still have to add three hydroxides to the right side. And so at that point, that is the only difference and you do everything else exactly the same. So the flow chart, same thing. <laughs> add your half reactions, check for them. Make sure that you made our OHs neutralize out any H pluses. Check to make sure that your elements are balanced and you should be okay. I, so still, okay, I'm, I'm still all for this. I like to add my OHs after we do the whole hydrogen thing. I like doing it right there. Um, if you want to do your charge, great, and then take care of everything. I just prefer to do it right when I add my H pluses because I know for a fact that at that point that can't exist. But that's just me. Again, this flowchart, either way, it's the exact same process. All right, galvanic cells. So 
Galvanic cells. What is a galvanic cell? It's a fancy word for a battery. Okay, sometimes it's called an electrolytic cell. Or no, not an electrolytic cell, a voltaic cell. I think that's what another word for it is. Uh, named after two scientists that basically create batteries um, or primitive batteries. So what is a battery? It's a device that uh, chemical energy can be... Uh, <laughs> it's a device uh, where chemical energy can be transferred into and transformed into electrical energy. Okay, so what is the driving force for a battery? It is spontaneous. So it is a spontaneous redox reaction, and it produces current that can do work. So here we have an anode and a cathode. Here we have a little porous disc. We have some metal being clamped together by a wire. And then we have another metal here also being clamped um, and connected to that wire. And so this side, the anode side, is losing electrons. The cathode side is gaining electrons. Oxidation happens at the anode. Reduction happens at the cathode. <laughs> The anode is the negatively charged part of your battery. The cathode is the positively charged part of your battery. The way that I remember this is an ox, right? So at the anode, oxidation happens, an ox. Now at the cathode, reduction happens. That's a red cat. So we have an ox and red cat. That's how you can remember the difference between both. Okay. What's that salt bridge, right? So there was a little porous disc in between both. What is the purpose of that? Well, a salt bridge or a porous disc is, is a device that allows ions to flow without extensive mixing of the solutions. If you mix the solutions directly together, right? Like if we decided to not have that salt bridge, um, the battery would go out almost immediately because all of the energy would be expended. Um, so to keep it a continuous flow of energy, what you do is you use a salt bridge or a porous disc. So the salt bridge or porous disc can be made out of whatever, right? I mean, if it's a porous disc, sometimes they just soak filter paper in an electrolytic solution. But a salt bridge is just something made out of, you know, sodium chloride, potassium chloride. It's like a little plug, basically, that connects both sides of your anode and cathode together. Now, cations build up at the cathode. That's where the term cathode comes from. Anions build up at the anode. That's where the term anode comes from. Now, without the salt bridge, the circuit isn't complete. So if you were to not have that, uh, literally no current will flow. Or what will happen is a current will flow for a little bit and then it will stop because the charge imbalance is too great. And in other words, what that means is you end up with too many positively charged things at one end and too many negatively charged things at the other end so that you know current can't flow anymore. It's not going to be spontaneous. With cell potential, um, is kind of the key to this. And a galvanic cell consists of, like it says, an oxidizing agent compartment and a reducing agent compartment. And the pull of electrons through that wire is basically the oxidizing agent and reducing agent uh, interacting. Okay, now that pull or driving force, we like to call that the cell potential. So that's E sub cell. So normally it's like a capital E with like a little cell in subscript form. Sometimes it can be called the electromotive force or EMF. Either way, they're the same thing. EMF, though, is a common more physics word, whereas cell potential I see a lot more in chemistry. So what is our unit of electrical potential? It is the term volts, like capital V. And what is a volt? It is one joule of work per coulomb of charge transferred. Do you need to really know that? Mm, probably not so much. That's more of a physics thing also. So all half reactions, okay? Whenever we are looking at a galvanic cell, we assume that they are at standard reduction potentials. In AP chemistry, you will never see something that is not at a standard reduction potential if it's asking you to calculate something, okay? Now, if it's asking you to infer something, like what would happen if the temperature were to increase or something like that, that's different. But calculation-wise, you only need to use standard reduction potentials. So where do we find that? Well, it's in table 17.1 in the seventh edition or Table 18.1 in the 8th edition onwards. Now, obviously, I haven't looked at every single edition, but up to the 10th, I'm pretty sure it's still table 18.1. So when we say standard, what do we mean? So one atmosphere of pressure, 25 degrees Celsius, and one mole per liter of whatever we're looking at. Those are the standard conditions. Now, when a half reaction is reversed, in other words, right, like let's say um, half reaction is written a particular way, 
And in my equation that I'm looking at, or in my redox reaction, it's facing the opposite direction. You reverse the sign of E. Now, when a half reaction is multiplied by something, let's say I need to like, you know, oh, I have to double, triple, or quadruple something, you actually don't change anything. So remember when we were um, looking at, oh man, I think it was in the thermochemistry unit. I feel like it probably was. When we were looking at um, different, um, we were looking at enthalpy changes, right? Um, we were doing something very similar to this, but we did have to multiply whatever the enthalpy was by whatever we were multiplying it by. In galvanic cells in electrochemistry, you don't do that. You do still, when you flip it, the sign is reversed, but when you multiply, you don't actually change anything. So a galvanic cell runs spontaneously, right? So good old Gibbs free energy. We want something to be spontaneous. And it goes in the direction that gives you a positive value of E. So whenever you see E cell, right, like, like the E sub cell, um, that means that you are looking for a positive value no matter what. Uh, that's because it's a galvanic cell. And only galvanic cells need to have that positive value. We'll talk about the opposite. Here is the equation. Um, so the energy of the, the cell, the electrolytic, I keep saying electrolytic, man. I told you I was going to be like constantly flubbing words. Uh, of the galvanic or voltaic cell, um, <laughs> that is equal to the E value of the cathode minus the E value of the anode. And remember, E is just the cell's potential. And we get that from the reduction potential table that is on you know, in, in the seventh edition here or in the eighth edition onward. All right, so taking a look at the equation that was on the previous page, I wanted to give you some generalities just so that you're able to figure out like what's going on, specifically for cathode and anode, since I know that occasionally when looking at a reduction potential chart, people get confused as to which one's which. So remember that for a galvanic cell, which are batteries like the ones we've been talking about, E cell has to be a positive value in order for it to be spontaneous. So this value here has to be a positive number. If it ends up being a negative number, that means that the galvanic cell won't work. That means that your battery just isn't actually going to give you any current at all. Now, the anode, this one here, in order to have this be a positive value, that must mean that this is either the smaller of the two values, right? Because then you're subtracting a larger number by a smaller number, or I guess I, I, guess I should say a positive number, by a smaller positive number, right? And that will give you, you know, a positive number here. Or it could be the more negative. If this is more negative, a double negative equals a positive, right? So then when you end up doing this, you end up getting a positive value for this. Now there is an electrolytic cell. So there is another type of cell that we're going to be talking about in a little bit. And keep in mind that that is the opposite. So the E cell has to be negative because you're literally connecting whatever we're doing to a power source. And so you have to force the reaction to actually occur as opposed to this one. So galvanic cells are spontaneous. Electrolytic cells are not spontaneous. All right, so let's take a look at our chart here. So if we take a look at our chart, Na plus or Cl2, which is the stronger oxidizing agent, Cl2 is right here at the top, Na is right here at the bottom. Notice that Na plus has a negative 2.71 voltage as its standard reduction potential, whereas Cl2 has 1.36, and that's a positive value. So technically, that would mean that the one with the more positive value here has the larger reduction potential. And so that means that Cl2 is a much better oxidizing agent, whereas Na plus here is definitely not. It's here at the very bottom. Line notation. So before we do an example of how to plug things into that uh, E cell equation, we're going to talk about line notation. So in order to abbreviate what's going on in a battery, um, chemists devised this notation called line notation. And the way it works is this. Anode components are always on the left side of our line notation. Cathode components are on the right and we use a double vertical line to indicate a salt bridge or a porous disk. The concentration of aqueous solutions should be specified in the notation when known. Um, it will, you will assume that the concentrations are standard, right? So 1.0 moles per liter, unless you give some other value. And so a good example would be like this. 
we have Mg as a solid with Mg2 plus aqueous. And so that must mean that since it's on the left side, this is my anode compartment. And so notice that this is my metal. This is my aqueous solution. I have a double line, and now I have aluminum, 3 plus. That must be my, you know, electrolyte. And then I have ALS. That must be my, you know, cathode stuff. So the double line here is separating the anode compartment from the cathode compartment. And we use a single line to represent the difference between the actual metal itself and the electrolytic solution that it is in. And so you can think of this as being our kind of salt bridge stuff. And so we've got some, you know, magnesium ions floating around in our salt bridge. And we've also got some aluminum ions floating around also in our salt bridge, um, going through the salt bridge to both sides. And so anode, that's this guy. Cathode, that's that side. Okay. So let's write the cell notation for mixing 1.0 molar Mg2 plus ions and 1.0 molar, that should just say silver ions. I don't know why the ends there. The salt bridge is going to contain nitrate. All right, so here's from here's the actual uh, entry from our um, from our table in the book. Notice this one is negative. This one is very, very, very slightly positive. So that must mean that when I'm looking at my anode, that my magnesium is on that side and that my silver is on this side. Remember, the more negative or the, uh, the, the, sm the, the smallest positive number, if there, is, you know, only, if there are only two positive numbers, uh, that's going to be on this side. So just like this, uh, notice that I have, instead of just um, Mg2+, I decided to include the nitrate there, since it said that the salt bridge contains nitrate ions. So it would be magnesium nitrate in an aqueous solution that we would have on that side. And then same thing on this side. All right, remember, that's the double line also. Let's do another one. So let's do gold and let's do nickel. All right, so here's gold, here's nickel. So which one's going to be on this side? Well, it's going to be the smaller of the two, and so or the more negative of the two. And so that's going to be nickel on this side, gold on that side. Again, that represents my salt bridge. Now let's actually use what we just learned about that E cell um, equation. What is the potential of the first cell we made? So let's remind ourselves that's the, these are the numbers that we had. And so that means that I'm going to take my number here and I'm going to subtract this much more negative number here to get a very positive value of voltage. All right, so let's talk about work. So work is never going to be equal to the maximum possible amount of current that can flow through. And that's because all real spontaneous processes are going to lose energy normally in the form of heat. So um, don't be surprised when you actually are doing this outright with like a voltometer and you're trying to figure out like, why am I slightly off? Why are my voltages slightly off? It's normally expected that you're never going to hit the maximum cell potential whenever you're actually doing this for real. Now also keep in mind, right, that this is directly related to the free energy difference between the reactants and the products in your cell. This is not something that you actually need to be able to do on the AP exam, okay? Um, but I believe that the equation is actually still on the equation sheet. So Gibbs free energy has a direct relationship between um, these values, F is a constant, by the way, here, and we actually will be using this constant, it's called Faraday's constant, um, in a bit. And so just keep in mind that there is a, a direct relationship between the spontaneity of a reaction in an uh, electrolytic or a galvanic cell and, you know, the relationship between these values. So there is a connection there. So concentration cell, also not necessarily something that's on the AP exam, but I just think it's kind of interesting, is um, a concentration cell is where you have the exact same metal. And so since they're the same metal, you would expect nothing's going to happen, right? No, like nothing should transfer. They're the exact same metal. But what is different is the concentrations. So here I have 0 0.01 um, as my concentration for my copper 2. Here I have 0.1. So it is, you know, there's a dramatic difference between both. And so incidentally, it's going to move, electrons will move from the lower concentrated stuff to the higher concentrated stuff like this. And there just so happens to be a connection between those two values. So Q, remember, and so that would be something that's not in equilibrium. 
um, is going to be related directly to the fraction between the two. Um, and that's anode over cathode. And I always just thought that was like a super interesting relationship. Um, and so again, it's not necessarily something that would show up on the AP exam, but that's what a concentration cell is. Um, it happens a lot with electroplating, like if you want to plate silver or something. Um, so electrolysis. All right, this is the end. We are finally to the last thing we're going to be talking about in electrochemistry. And so that's electrolysis. So we've been talking about galvanic cells this whole time. What's the opposite? An electrolytic cell or an electrolysis cell, whatever you'd want to call that, is where you're basically forcing current through a cell to produce a chemical change, right? And remember, that means our cell potential is negative. It's not spontaneous. We are forcing it to do this. And so you can do that with an external battery like this, a power source, something like that. Um, and literally here, um, you have like a silver rod and you have a piece of jewelry, presumably, and you're going to be plating it in silver. And that's just because you are forcing this reaction to occur. So an interesting byproduct of electrolysis is there is a direct connection between how much time um, you allow the battery to do this and how much plating you get on whatever you are trying to plate. And so there is a flow chart for that. If there's a direct connection between the amount of current that you are basically forcing through the circuit and how much time you let it do that. And that's going to directly relate to the quantity of the charge in Coulombs, how many electrons are being transferred, the moles of your unknown and the grams of your unknown. And so literally it is just a flow chart of dimensional analysis, current in time, quantity of charge, moles of electrons, moles of whatever you're looking for, and grams of whatever you're looking for. So we're going to use that um, in a second. Now, current and time, what's the relationship there? When you multiply amps and seconds together, that gives you charge. So if you've ever wondered about amperes and amperage before, it's a relationship when you multiply how many seconds you're applying um, those amps for, that's how much charge you're building up, basically. And how do we get from you know charge to moles of electrons? Well, we use this constant. And so the Coulombs of charge can be basically canceled out by dividing by 96,485. And that will give you the moles of electrons. So here's a really interesting question. I just thought it was interesting, okay? And is it an AP style question? Definitely. I have an unknown metal. It's being electrolyzed. I'm applying, you know, a current of two amps for 52.8 seconds to plate 0 0.0719 grams of a metal. And I know that the solution has this type of formula. So in other words, this is my unknown metal that I'm plating, and I have three nitrate ions. What is my metal? All right, that's our flow chart. Step one, I need to multiply these two together in order to get charge. When I do that, I get 105.6 coulombs. Step two, quantity of charge in coulombs, let's get that to moles. All right. So I take that number, I divide by 96,485, and I get this tiny amount of moles. Now, remember, <laughs> I don't know how else to put this. So this is the key. So in reality, I need to divide by three, right? Why? Because technically, this is letting me know that this has a three. It has a three plus charge, basically, right? So I have to divide by three in order to make sure that my stoichiometry is correct for my question. If I were to have left it at 1.09 times 10 to the negative three, that would mean that I am looking at a one-to-one -one relationship between these two. That's not what's happening in reality. It's a three-to-one. So I have to divide by three in order to get the correct number. Now, great. I have moles. What do I do? Think about it. I'm given grams, and now I have moles. If I divide grams by moles, that's going to give me molar mass. So 0 0.0719 grams is what I was given. Divide by the number of moles. I get 197 grams per mole. 
there's one element on the periodic table that has a molar mass of 197, and that is gold. All right, last question. Consider a solution that contains 0.1 moles per liter of each of the following. Predict the order in which the metals will plate out if the voltage is turned up from zero, and why. Let's take a look at our chart. All right, so notice that copper was the very first one on the list, and then the next one that I hit is tin, and then I hit lead, and then I hit nickel, and then I hit zinc. That means that would be the order that they would plate out in. So copper being first, then tin, then lead, then nickel, and then we skip a couple and we go to zinc. Why? The more negative the potential, the less likely it is to plate out. These alkali metals, you're not going to be able to, you're not going to plate them out. <laughs> under regular conditions, right? And that makes sense. You're not going to be able to make lithium metal and sodium metal this way very effectively. Um, so technically, as we go down, we are getting more, like we're getting more likely to plate up here, less likely to plate as we go down. So silver, pretty easy to plate. It's pretty high up on this list, and all the rest of these aren't really metals. All right, so that is literally it. If you have any questions, let me know. Like and subscribe. I'm going to be going through the 10th edition at some point, so look forward to that in the future.